welcome to Clonally in Williamsburg and we are at our dyeing, weaving and spinning shop. Um, but today we're outside around our dye yard. I'm, and I, I'm Karen, um, this is Annie and Joe is behind me. And I just want to remind you that if you have questions at any point, type them in um, and let us know what you're interested in and curious about and we'll be happy to answer them. So what we're doing right now is kind of focusing on some professional dyes. We know there's a few dyers here in town in Williamsburg in the 18th century, updating your wardrobes so that you can keep up with style and fashion. So I'm just gonna get right to it. So we've got several copper pots behind me. And so we're gonna go through each one, talk a little bit about each one, focus on the history of one semi-local uh, dye um, and the chemistry behind it. So let's get started. So um, we're gonna talk about one of the ones that we're working with that it's really lovely so that we can get a beautiful highlighter yellow out of it. It's called fustic. Fustic is a tropical plant from Central and South America. And a lot of these dyes come from Central and South America when the Spanish conquered that neck of the woods. They found the indigenous folks wearing glorious color and they capitalized on that color. So I'm gonna put in a little bit of yarn, some wool yarn, and we'll come back to that in a minute to see how we're doing. The next dye that we're working with is one that is one of our favorites. Um, that dye is called cochineal. And cochineal, some of you may be familiar with it, whether you realize it or not, <clears throat> but they're tiny insects. Yes, insects. <laughs> and these insects, these cochineal bugs, have been um, systematically applied to prickly pear cactus farms. And those, they farm cactus like we farm corn. Um, and so they've developed over the years, when you have a stationary bug and you're a bird, that's a buffet. So they develop this stuff in their skeleton called carminic acid. And the little flecks of red on that skeleton is a deterrent to predators. It just happens to be the best red dye. You know it as carmine, carneal, cochin, lake 40, E120, and a bunch, a bunch of other uh, combinations. Um, it's our natural food coloring today. So we're gonna put a little bit of, of our yarn in that cochineal and see what we get. So in the 18th century, people would have used their dyers to update their wardrobes. So we're gonna put a little bit of that into our, our red pot. The next one that we have is matter root. Matter root is um, an invasive weed in the Middle East. It gives us wonderful pale peaches, oranges, all the way up to rusty reds. The British enlisted were wearing um, a lot of this color, cheaper, rustier red. And they earned the nickname lobster back um, because it looked like a cooked lobster color. So the other one that we have is in back and um, this is black walnut. And that's our local dye. And that local dye um, provides us with the color and the tannic acid necessary to get that dye to stick. The outer husk of that walnut is cooked down um, to give us our beautiful browns. The shades that I'm wearing today. Um, the final one that we're gonna work with today is a little bit of indigo, indigo ferratinctoria, a big cash crop in South Carolina, but we can also grow a little bit of it here in Tidewater, Virginia. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the history of that indigo plant. Yeah, so indigo has a really rich and complex history. Indigo bearing plants, and when we're referring to indigo, we're actually referring to over 50 species of plants that contain the indigo dye substance itself. Um, these plants are bright green leafy plants. Oftentimes they resemble butterfly bushes. There's a very complex process to actually extract the dye and make it into the blue dye substance we find in our dye pot today. This history has existed for over 6,000 years and found all throughout the world in places like India, Egypt, West African countries, Central and South America, and more recently actually in terms of history in North America. Settlers early on when trying to find different cash crops uh, that were going to be most profitable in the New World attempted to grow indigo as early as the 1620s in Virginia, but with very little success due to the lack of information and knowledge on how to cultivate, harvest, and then process it. 
It wasn't until 1743 when a young woman, Eliza Lucas, actually with her interest in botany comes into, uh, in, into charge of her family's three plantations, decides to experiment with additional crops other than rice. She tries things like figs, oak, and then finds ultimately success with the indigo and finds that the climate and culture in South Carolina would support that. Much of the credit to the success is actually due to the enslaved men and women working on those larger plantations in South Carolina. Joe's going to touch on a little bit more about the expertise and the detail involved for that one dye pot to work so successfully. Some of the expertise that we're talking about that those enslaved individuals are bringing is making sure the chemistry in this dye pot works correctly every time you want to use it. So unfortunately, the indigo that we're working with doesn't bind onto your fiber if there's any oxygen present. But on the flip side of that, it won't turn the brilliant shade of blue we're looking for without oxygen. So to get that to work in our dye pot, we need to create an anaerobic environment. And the big issue comes from that with all of our other dye pots, we're cooking it down into pots of water. Water being H2O means there's too much oxygen in the pot, it won't dye. So we actually have to pull some of that oxygen out using a secondary ingredient, something that in the 18th century, we call SIG, which is stale human urine. Specifically, according to our 18th century dye books, human urine from prepubescent boys with an onion-rich, alcohol-free diet. Now, modern chemistry, we know they're producing the highest concentrations of a secondary chemical called thiourea dioxide, which is ionized ureic acid that will bind to your oxygen molecules and that creates the anaerobic environment that we're looking for. And when we do put things into our dye pot, they're going to get that dye bound onto them, but when you pull it out, you're not gonna get the color you expected at first. Without the oxygen present, it gives you more of a pale green color. But as it comes out of the dye pot, as it gets exposed to the oxygen in the air, it'll give you that nice shade of blue. We'll even go ahead and dump it into one of our rinse buckets full of water. Again, more oxygen knocks off some of the excess dye, but it also provides that color. But sometimes this color is not as even as you might hope it would be. As a matter of fact, when we work here, we usually work with wool. Those protein fibers take that dye better than anything else, but we can put it on any fiber. We actually have a few here that we're going to be trying out today. So soaking on this stick to make sure that all of these yarns have completely plumped up, their cells are ready to accept that dye, we have multiple different kinds of fiber. We have a wool, the protein fiber we were talking about, two cellulose fibers, we have a linen and a cotton, and the nice white one on the end here is a synthetic dye as well. And you'll see each one's gonna take the dye differently. So we're gonna go ahead and dump that into our dye pot, being careful not to let water and excess oxygen drip into that dye pot. And as we do, we're just making sure that all the oxygen little bubbles float up and out of the way and it's ready to accept that dye. And we're just gonna leave it in there for a little bit. So let's take a look at what we've put into our dye pots. And I'm gonna pull out the yellow one. I think you'll be quite surprised. So the heat is what's gonna help set it. So this wonderful fustic gives us this wonderful blue or blue, uh, yellow dye. Um, but again, we've gotta protect it from the sun. So. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of rinse it off a little bit um, and then I'm going to stick it in my blue dye pot and we're going to see what happens. So if you remember back in second grade when you started mixing colors together, um, we're going to get hopefully a nice pretty green. And it doesn't take very long. So I'm going to just let it sit in there for a minute and we're going to pull out our red one. So you want to start out with your, your most concentrated rich colors first. Um, because as you pull that dye out, it's going to weaken that dye bath and you're going to wind up with some pastels at the end of the day. Um, so that was just a couple minutes in the dye pot, but when you rinse this off, it's going to be a very pale pink. So you need to overshoot the color by at least two shades. It's like paint. So <clears throat> it's going um, to, it's going to dry a lot lighter and a lot of that dye is going to rinse right off. Um, so you know, ha have to know and have that experience as an apprentice to earn that expertise and understanding how to manipulate these fibers so that they, um, you get the color you want when you want it. So I'm going to put him back in. We've got another one in here that's been sitting for a little while. Um, and this is some hand spun yarn um, that we did a little earlier. Um, so it's getting a little bit darker than when we started out. So we're going to let him soak for a few minutes. The orange back here, we've got another hand spun in here. Um, so it's doing pretty well. Looks like a pretty um, pumpkin orange. 
Um, if we wanted to jack the heat up, you're going to see more pink and red tones coming in. Um, again, get it, manipulating the fire, the temperature, um, the concentration um, to get the color we want. And Joe's going to, because this is heavy, um, we've got a, a piece of material um, that's a faux fur made out of silk. Um, and we're dyeing it rich brown. Um, this has been in uh, for quite a while. Uh, it's going to be a trim on a cloak for the from, for the milliner staff. So let's let's take a look at my yellow I just put in there in, in the indigo. Let's see what happens. So as it as it comes out, you're going to see that lovely shade of green starting to emerge because the oxygen is hitting it. Um, and you can get rich, rich, beautiful greens. Um, it's going to take um, just a couple of minutes for it to kind of kind of set. But who says you can't get brilliant color um, because you can? Any color of the rainbow except neon. Sorry, it's coming in 1856. So I'm going to have um, Joe pull out the blue and we're going to see what happens with our different types of fibers. So again, we're just kind of twirling it around, getting, letting the oxygen hit it. Um, we're going to rinse it off, kind of knock off the excess. And we're going to see if there's a difference between those fibers. So there's, there's the synthetic one, I synthetic, think. Synthetic. Our there's, cellulose. That's your cotton. And our protein. And there's our protein. So you have to understand how to manipulate these dyes to, again, so that you can get the colors you want when you want them. Indigo is probably the only one that you can uh, apply to a synthetic in order to get um, the, col the, the color applied to the top. It's a top dye. It just sits on top of the surface of the fiber. Um, it never penetrates the whole thing. So when you rip your blue jeans, and I see a lot of folks out there wearing blue jeans that are, um, they've got holes in them. Um, and you've got these white fibers that are showing because that indigo just never, never penetrates the whole thing. So we've left you with a little bit of information about what we've done over, with some of these dye stuff. So ask questions about anything that you're curious about and what you might want to know more about. Yeah, thank you all. Um, speaking of, of the different sorts of fibers, Susie was curious if you would ever use, if there were better temperatures for animal fibers or plant-based fibers, or would you just always keep things at the same temperature? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think it, it's not so much the the, um, the fiber itself, it's the, it's the dye stuff that you're worried about um, and how it's gonna react to the heat. Um, so with animal fibers, like you're in, in modern times, you can use everything from mohair um, to alpaca, to llama, to a lot of different kinds of protein fibers. Um, you just have to be careful not to agitate it because um, the agitation along with the, um, the heat is going to take the scales that are on the outside of the, the hair shaft and it's going to flare them out slightly. So the more agitation um, that you apply is going to start making it into felt. So you need to be really careful about stirring it in the pot. I think it's more the issue than the temperature. So to, maybe to that end, with the risk of, of agitating things and so forth, uh, Maria was wondering if you would ever dye a fabric that's, I mean, fabric, something that's already woven. Sure, absolutely. And we think a lot of the professional dyers working in a city like Williamsburg, the capital of Virginia, are often taking those pre-existing garments, suits, gowns, whatever it might be that needs a re refreshing or an update, disassembling them, perhaps the tailor or milliner's disassembling that garment for you. And then you could have it re-dyed, refashioned, and for a fraction of the cost, you have a very new look. We know in this part of Virginia um, and in many colonies, about 90 to 95 percent of our textiles would have been imported. Our concept of ready-made is in the fabric form. You're purchasing the yardage, you're having it custom fit, custom made, and then to keep it in play, if the fabric's still in good shape, you're going to take advantage of the work of the dyer to ensure that that color and that fashion is still trending. Great question. Thank you. Um, Abby was wondering if some colors are easier to, to dye, others are more difficult, and if so, what would, what would be, make the difference? That is a very good question. Some colors are absolutely easier to dye than others. Uh, one of the ones that we use a little bit more sparingly, because we talked about that yellow fading in sunlight very quickly and us needing to put something over it, is a very easy color to get. A lot of 
plant-based dyes, especially anything that's green and leafy, if you cook it down over time, will lose a lot of its color and it will end up that yellow shade. We wanna get you the nice bright yellow, so we're importing things like fustic from South America. We'll import things like turmeric coming out of India. And then some of our harder dyes, actually the Karen, or Karen's been showing off some of these greens, that's gonna be one of your hardest dye colors. Like we said, that green is gonna be a little bit more fugitive because all the things in nature giving you green are gonna cook out and fade away. So you have to combine blue and yellow dye to get there, and this can be very complicated. Do you put blue on first and then yellow on top? Yellow on first and blue on top will give you a large variation between your emerald greens, your forest greens, and even your teal colors as well. What's more, yellow being your fastest fading dye with blue your most chemically unique dye, so much so that if you wanna be a dyer in the 18th century, you would serve an apprenticeship, which could be a formal seven year long unpaid training session. A green dyer might be expected to put extra time on top of that to get you that color. But with that being said, it is a very fashionable color. And here at Colonial Williamsburg, especially in our government buildings, namely our Capitol building, you'll see a lot of green being used. And a lot of times in, in um, England that you've got dyers that are competing and that they may specialize um, in, in a series of colors and not all colors. Absolutely. So popular question from Barbara, Tina, and Susie, all curious about do you, do you fix things after you dye them so the colors don't bleed? So that's pretty typical with chemical and synthetic dyes today to make sure that that color sticks uh, after it comes out of the dye pot. Um, setting the color for us is actually a step prior to even dipping it into the dye pot. Uh, so it's called applying a mordant, mordanting the fiber. That actual term comes from a French word, modere, meaning to bite. So we're applying a, a chemical, actually a metal salt called alum. Uh, an alum water solution will soak that fiber in whatever form it might be in, in the raw form, the spun form, or the fabric form, for a couple hours ahead of time, actually bring it to a, a gentle simmer. And that's gonna create this chemical bridge between the fiber and the dye once it's actually submerged into the dye pot. So what really is gonna seal the deal and ensure the color fastness and light fastness is the temperature of the dye pot. And um, again, as we discussed earlier, that temperature certainly varies from one dye to the next. There are, as always, a lot of exceptions um, to the rule. Some dyes, for example, like the indigo, actually does not require mordant. With that chemical reaction that occurs in the dye pot, it's actually preset, predetermined. You don't have to pre-treat the cloth. Uh, another one um, that we are actually working with today, the only locally sourced dye the professionals are using, black walnut, has built-in mordant uh, capabilities as well with the tannic acid that's found in the hull of the nut. You already have a way of keeping that color stuck in the fabric. And that's something that a lot of people are familiar with today, even though you might not be uh, directly aware of it. A lot of things we describe today as having tannins in them, coffee, tea, red wine, all stain really badly it's because they include both a dye stuff and that fixative agent at the same time in the same thing so it's something you have to be a little bit aware of so we'd rather drink coffee and yeah tea. yeah no nothing like that <laughs> red wine where <laughs> so if you can play the uh, dying helpline for a moment um veronica is growing some indigo with the hopes of, of making her own dye Oof. can you give her some advice and also and i'm sure other people would be curious about this too what are some good sources she can look to for how to do this? Okay, good sources to look to to, to how to do it. Um, we use a lot of 18th century dye books that have some complicated recipes in them. Um, a big part of our job and the apprenticeship and the training we do is translating these, but I know Karen here has experimented with some of the more modern dyes and some of the more modern dye books that you can use. Um, so there's a a couple of things. Um, we're going to be uh, growing indigo for the first time. We're going to try processing it for the first time this year. We may look like a bunch of Smurfs at the end of the year, but we're going to give it a go. Um, it's a composting, um, you know, and, and they refer to it as fermentation, but it's really a composting um, and breaking down uh, to get get the, the endoxyl released from the plant. Um, and it's a series of, you know, kind of washing and kind of getting, flushing that, that dye out, getting that sediment to have it evaporate so that you, you work with that sludge um, to form into balls or cakes. Um, since we've never worked with it before, um, 
it's going to be part of our archaeologically archaeology research um, and experimentation with it. Um, it's a huge process. You see in third world countries or some uh, some videos on online. Um, in turn, but we've never done it before in the real world. Um, so stay tuned. It may be a future um, live stream. Yeah, you I'd, never know. I'd say, you know, a big tip, grow a lot. Um, you yes. know, a lot of that raw material amounts to a very, very small amount of the potent dye substance. Um, you know, for roughly 28 pounds of your raw leaves, you might only end up with about one ounce of the dye substance. And, you know, an ounce goes a long way. With our current dye pot we've prepared, there are nearly 20 gallons of water in there and, you know, the equivalent of the SIG, as Joe mentioned, the stale human urine, um, but with only about four tablespoons of the actual indigo dye substance. Um, but you do have to start with a, a fair amount of the actual raw material. Um, we have found a number of primary sources that actually describe that process in great detail and construction of these very large vats that actually siphon and kind of funnel into the next one. Um, South Carolina gazettes actually contain a number of these articles and these journals, gentlemen journals, that are describing uh, that exact process. So, you know, you can look to the 18th century for some of that advice as well. So Natalie, and, and probably some of our other viewers can't see the fire underneath your pot. So they were there. She was curious about how these are heated, but maybe you could speak to how hot we need to get uh, these pots, how we how you check the temperature and so forth. Sure, uh, that's an easy one. So we've been dying for a few hours already today. Um, <sighs> our fires are out and we are very happy about that because our dye pots, as, as Karen alluded to, are copper. They're holding quite a bit of that heat in and we do need to maintain a very in some cases, small window of temperature. So something like our indigo dye pot here requires a temperature between about 120 and 150 degrees. Under that, and the chemical reaction won't happen, over that, and it'll kill it off. So you'll see us in this one especially, we'll get in hands deep. It's a little bit warm, it might sting a little bit, but honestly, that's how we're judging the temperature as well. The joke between all of us is, well, what temperature do you like your bath water? Do you know exactly what temperature it's going to be, or do you stick a hand in and find out? So we'll stick our hands into this, and we've done this enough times, we can kind of tell, oh, that's too hot, that's too cold. So we've let our fires die out. There's a lot of liquid in these pots. There's a lot of metal holding that heat, but each one does require a slightly different temperature. And we are being very careful with that. And we like to say we're using all of our senses. Are you looking into the dye pot to see, is it bubbling? I know it's boiling then, and I know that's gonna be that temperature. Is it steaming? Can you smell it? So on and so forth. And as Karen just demonstrated, sometimes you stick your hand in a pot that's a little bit too hot, and you'll find out the hard way. <laughs> So as we talk about all of these bold and beautiful colors, Tina, of course, wants to know about bright white. How do we get a, a really nice, <laughs> consistent bright white color? There are a number of bleaching techniques in the 18th century. Um, a, a really good example of um, bleaching before you might even want to add the color to the fiber is uh, from a plant called flax. Flax is the, the fiber, the source of your linen cloth. And naturally, as it comes out of the stem through a great deal of, of, of physical labor to strip the stalk of the woodiness and access the fiber within, you have golden yellow strands um, that might lead to kind of a greenish hue if you plan to dye it with indigo. So there are bleaching yards, these brilliant depictions of bleach, bleaching yards rather in Harlem in the Netherlands. And they're showing the power of the sun. They wet the fabric, lay it out on the grass, um, usually a, a frame to lift it just off the, the grass that it might be on. And when you think about the key ingredient in your uh, laundry room today, maybe you use OxyClean. Think about photosynthesis that's occurring underneath that fabric as the grass releases oxygen. It also helps to remove and lift the color out of the fiber. That's uh, a longer investment of time though. If you need a quick and dirty, and I actually mean dirty, um, bleaching recipe, uh, maybe Joe might want to share a little bit more about that bleaching technique. Uh, we have a co-apprentice who at the end of her, her apprenticeship was doing a large project and he did some bright white linen. So she decided she was going to make chlorine bleach. We have recipes to do that in the 18th century. And it's just a few simple ingredients. You got to get your hands on some buttermilk, some lye, and just a little bit of cow manure. And she mixed all of those together in a pot, let it sit out in some bright sunlight, and it curdled and split and smelled kind of bad. But at the end of that, a clear liquid came to the surface, which she was able to siphon off. 
and that was 100% chlorine bleach. And she tried that and she did some experimentation with that. And in the end, she decided to go with sun bleaching for all of her yarn. So speaking of bleach, and we always think of bleach as, as a cleaning thing, uh, Maria noticed that your hands are different colors and uh, wants to know, is that a badge of honor uh, for a dyer or is that something that you actively try to scrub out? But maybe answer that and then talk to us a little bit about how do dyers work also to maintain fabrics and, and clothing? So if the color is fading or, or if something's been stained, would you be involved in, in dealing with that? Absolutely. All good questions. Um, I think it's kind of a badge of honor. It's lots Me of fun. Um, luckily, it'll clean up relatively quickly at the end of a dye day to make sure we've knocked off any of the extra dye and to make sure our colors won't run if they get wet or you wash them. We'll wash them heavily and thoroughly and that'll take a lot of this dye stuff off your hands, the one exception being your fingernails. That's going to stick there for a long time, especially that indigo, because again, didn't need that mordant to stick. So you're going to be stuck with that for a while till you get in there with a brush and really scrub it, or, or it'll go away eventually. We don't worry about it too much. Yeah. As I like to say, I'll never be a hand model. Yeah. Um, so eventually it wears off because our hands aren't stuck in a mordant um, and, and so we don't have that binding uh, molecule. But, it, it, you know, just make sure, you know, that the priest knows that, you know, when you go up for communion that, you know, you're not, you're not you know, oxygen deprived when you've got indigo hands. Um, as far as taking care, we know that a lot of these dyers are actually kind of offering a service and kind of acting like dry cleaners um, for us today, I guess, is the best equivalent. Um, they advertise, in many cases, spot removal. Um, they advertise, you know, fancy pressing. Um, a lot of gowns and a lot of um, details require some expertise in kind of making everything beautiful again. Um, there's a dyer that advertises up in Philadelphia um, that he, he's advertised to a certain demographic um, for folks coming over on boats from the old world to the new world. And you may have, you know, be on ship for a couple of months without a shower. And he's advertising that, not only that, but he can take out sun damage. He, you know, when you're on deck, you're probably going to have some sun damage. Mold and mildew, he can take out lime juice to keep away scurvy. Um, he, can, he can refresh all your colors and bring you back to life, all your, your fabrics, um, and list all these fabrics in two things. Um, he can do all these colors, but every Friday they're doing black and they're dumping everything in at the end of the week. And the second thing, the last line I had to read a few times to make sure I read it right, he can even take out cat piss, which, you know, is their cats are on board to keep the rats down and they're apparently going anywhere they, they want to go. Um, so he's acting not only as a dyer, but to refresh and make you human again as you're getting off these boats. Um, so the dyers here in Williamsburg are probably updating your wardrobes, um, probably not dealing with the last part of that advertisement. Um, <laughs> you never know, um, but they're acting kind of like a dry cleaner would be today. Thanks. Uh, Doug was curious about corrosive dyes. Were corrosive dyes around in the 18th century or is this a 19th century development? <laughs> yes, kind of. We see some. Um, we're using almost all plant-based dyes. That cochineal red we were talking about being the one insect-based dye. We really haven't gotten into a lot of these synthetic, artificial, and metal-based dyes yet. Those will be around in the next century and they can be corrosive. The one big exception we see, one we're not working with today, is logwood from the Campeche tree in South America. And we've come across instances of that and what it does to fabric. It'll give you a beautiful purple, but after about 10 years or so, when you don't have any say in the matter, it doesn't matter what you do to your fabric, if you keep it out of sunlight, it's gonna kind of fade to a gray shade. And then Karen here has actually seen what it'll do after more than a few years. It, it actually um, is very acidic. Um, and it'll actually eat the fabric. Um, so we, we tend to stay away from that one on a permanent level. We'll do it as demonstrations. Um, but um, in terms of making it, um, you know, a dye that we're, that's gonna be long, long lived, um, we tend not to use it because of the acidity um, and because of um, the, the fading issue. The other thing that we see is the, the dye additives. And the dye additives can be something like Sugar of lead, which is my favorite, it sounds a little yummy. Um, mercury and um, arsenic, um, and so the, and you've got these 
chemical compounds made with hydrochloric acid and sulfuric acids. So you've got these really nasty compounds um, that they're using, and we tend to kind of shy away from those. Chrome comes in in the 19th century, which is, gives you brilliant color. I've worked with it a little bit, but boy, is that that's something you've really got to stay on top of, um, especially if you're um, dumping out excess dyes. You don't want that entering into the ground. It's pretty poisonous. Um, and, you know, we tend to, to stay away from some of those dyes um, just because I'd like to see retirement. So with, with such an international cast of characters in terms of the, the dye stuff, how tied up was this with international politics? Um, do things become more or less available throughout the 18th century or more or less fashionable? Um, and and what, what, what's driving that? A hundred percent. It's very much politics. It's very much based in politics. Uh, a, a resource I've been using pretty heavily recently is from the Linen Board of Manufacture in Ireland. They've been set up by England. They have government funding, funding to produce linen fabric. And the reason they're doing this is in 1699, England passes the Wool Acts, makes wool illegal for their colonies to produce. They want them buying wool from England. And you'll see huge amounts of fabric moving hands. Uh, what's great for me is this linen board manufacturer gets into a little bit of trouble with the government just a few years before the revolution breaks out, starts keeping excellent records, which is how we know in 1771, they're exporting 26 million yards of finished linen fabric overseas. Fast forward a few years down the road, it's 40 million in 1990, and these dyes are going to be no exception. We like to say that our cochineal is one of our most expensive dyes. It's not exactly hard to get your hands on, but it only comes out of the Spanish Empire, namely out of parts of Mexico at this time period. And the Spanish Empire and the British Empire aren't always on the greatest turns. I mean, Annie here knows they're moving lots of it every year. Yeah, nearly 875,000 pounds of this dried dead insect would have been shipped from Spain throughout the world. And, you know, while certain ingredients are harder to come by come wartime, there are a lot of publications just on kind of the eve of the revolution encouraging colonists to start to grow some of their own dye materials, um, especially up in New England where it's a little cooler and might not be the best climate to grow indigo. Colonists are encouraged to start to grow another uh, indigo bearing dye plant called woad. Um, that is a little bit more sustainable in that area. Even someone like Thomas Jefferson at Monticello starts to grow the matter dye plant. It's an invasive species we know uh, will come from the Middle East in the dye substance itself, but we also see that endeavor to, to become more self-sufficient. And it also starts to represent more of that homespun movement as well and becomes closely tied to that patriotic spirit. So a, a big complex market for all of this stuff in the 18th century. Diane was curious about today, is there still a market for things like cochineal and, and maybe all of these things? Is it more a niche sort of thing or, or some of these things used in, in large scale? So, you know, all of these dye stuffs that we're using today, um, they're, even though they're the same kind of dye stuffs that are still acceptable or available on the open market, um, so working with, so it, it's a commitment to time. There's a lot of time involved in prepping up these dye stuffs. And I have to say, it, they're, they're a little more expensive than working with your instant gratification, a spoonful of your chemical dyes. Um, so people tend to shy away for those two reasons, so the time and the expense of working with natural dyes. Um, however, um, there's a lot of reward in using something um, natural um, and that you know where it's been, you know how to manipulate it. And there's more of a challenge, I think, for anybody that wants to work with dyes. Um, so chemical dyes are great. And I encourage you too, that if you, you know, have a summer, uh, a summer uh, project with your kids or you wanna experiment, there's lots of things that you can use from your spice cupboard, like a, a turmeric, for example. Um, you can use Kool-Aid. Um, I see a lot of people with hair dyed with Kool-Aid. Well, you can do the same thing with fiber. Um, and your kids smell great at the end of it. Um, and there's uh, black beans, red cabbage, and a lot of different kinds of things that you can use um, that, you know, that, that are kind of home dyes or what we call folk dyes. 
So, and um, those folk dyes are things that you can see, you know, in, in your inv own environment and experiment with. Um, and that's half the fun is the experimentation. And I think what keeps us going a lot of times is that when we look at, you know, applying some of these recipes and applying these techniques and processes, um, we get a sense of discovery at the end. It's like sticking your hand in your pocket and finding money you forgot about, that little rush of discovery and understanding. And sometimes it's more about the process than sometimes the end result. Um, so, you know, some of these dye stuff you can grow, there's, there's a, a, some books out there on how to grow your own dye gardens. Um, there's books out there that, you know, that you can acquire, you know, certain kinds of dye stuffs that, you know, um, and, and places where you can, you can achieve that kind of uh, relationship with those suppliers. Um, so I encourage you to try anything um, is my bottom line. I'm a fiber pusher. I'm a dyer pusher. Uh, anything that you want to experiment with and have fun with, it's really the bottom line. Thanks so much. Um, that's a great note to sort of begin to wrap things up on. One, one final question for you from Natalie. It's sort of related to that. So we can, there's a lot of good tools that people can go at home, go home and experiment with, with dyes. Um, but Natalie wanted to know, is there any way they, folks watching can buy the things that you dye or learn directly from you? Do you offer classes ever on, on this stuff? Uh, yes, you can buy it from us. So we do quite a bit of dyeing and we spin quite a bit of our own yarn. We were talking about our hand spun we were using. Unfortunately, we have the same problem our 18th century counterparts had, which is we can't physically spin enough yarn to, to try to use it on a daily basis. So we make a lot of what we lovingly refer to as one skein wonders. Is more of us to get practice of the spinning and dyeing. So a lot of what we, we do here in our dye yard does get sold to the public in the end. So here at our weaving, spinning, and dyeing shop, we have uh, quite a few skeins of yarn. And there's also a few stores here at Colonial Williamsburg, like the Prentice store just down the street from us that uh, uh, sell some of our dyed yarn as well. And we're always happy to experiment. We always love to do fun things. And with that, you've all heard of a mic drop. I'm doing an apron up. I want it darker. <laughs> Company property. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Annie, Karen, and Joseph. Um, this program was made possible through the generosity of our donors, for which we are grateful. To learn how you can support presentations like this, follow the link pinned to the comments below or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. Uh, Thank you, weavers, for, for joining us today. Good luck with your new apron. Um, any, any final thoughts to send us on our way? Um, I just encourage you to you know, explore and discover. Um, and, you know, this, the, the fiber world is big and huge. Um, and to try something, we're always going to need people working with our hands. Um, and this is just one aspect of it. So I encourage you all to try something. Um, you never know where it's going to take you.